Good afternoon, Professor Shu. Um, this is Ryan Stanton, and this is my second installment in our presentation series. Um, and today, I want to be—I will be discussing a topic that I think is important uh, in my life as well as everybody's lives. I feel like this topic is—it covers a broad range of uh, of different, you know, relationships in a in an organization, and. Um, I think it's some great history behind it, so let's just jump into it. Today I'll be discussing leadership and the history of leadership and how it has affected organizational behavior as well as organizational management as a whole. Um, to start off, I, again, I'd like to thank you, Professor Shu, for giving us this task. Uh, this class has been fantastic. It's been great to learn about organizational behavior, and I know that it'll be useful in my career and my life. I would also like to thank my dad for videoing again. Um, and excuse the setup, uh, we're, you know, we're doing our best, but here we go, let's jump into it. So, uh, leadership. To, uh, to understand the history of leadership, you kind of need to go back to, to the beginning. Um, it, people first started studying leadership in the 1900s, um, and it was a pretty basic study of leadership. It was essentially what can we do or change from a leadership perspective to increase our production and our profit levels towards the bottom of the, of the organization as you move down in the power structure. So you know, the first studies came out in the early 1900s. Um, since then, there's been uh, many different schools of thought about leadership that have been developed. Um, but today we're just gonna be discussing the 10 really big ones, the 10 main ones, and, uh, and yeah. So some of these studies, um, some of these schools of thought are more widely studied than others just because times have changed and as we learn more about leadership we learn more about what actually goes into being a great and effective leader so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into these theories um, first theory I'd like to discuss the original school of thought in terms of, a, of leadership is known as trait theory and trait theory makes sense it's it's um, it's a pretty basic way of looking at leadership um, it was what was studied in the early 1900s, and it was essentially solely based on attributes. So, for example, um, if John, say, take, we'll take John, he has um, $100 million, and he's great with people, and he's a good-looking guy, and, uh, and yeah, he comes from a position of power. We're going to take him as opposed to, for example, Mark, who has $100, um, he's not that wealthy, not that powerful, and not that good of people. The trait theory essentially just said, we're going to pick John because he has better traits than Mark, for our example. So that's trait theory. Like I said, pretty basic, but, but uh, the building blocks of leadership. So um, trait theory was studied for many years. There wasn't very many the people that opposed or had different viewpoints about leadership up until the 1950s. And people started studying behavioral theory. And behavioral theory was an interesting school of thought. It didn't last too long, about 20 years. It kind of fizzled out in the 1970s. Uh, behavioral theory more focused on how the leader acted in an organization, as opposed to who they were and their, just their strictly their traits and characteristics. But um, so uh, although behavioral theory kind of fizzled out in the 1970s, many ideas about it are still used in other schools of thought that we study in leadership today. Uh, moving on, we've got contingency theory. Um, contingency theory was, after behavioral theory kind of fizzled out, a man named Dr. Fiedler started looking into contingency theory and focused on how, um, focused on basically the fact that leadership can be, Dr. Fiedler believed that leadership can be broken down into three basic, uh, three basic things. Um, the first of those being the LMX leader member relationship, which I, we talked about in my last video presentation, and essentially just the relationship between the leader and the members of an organization. Uh, the second thing is how the leader organized and structured tasks. Uh, Dr. Fiedler found that some leaders that structured tasks differently or in a better way had clearly better results as opposed to people who weren't very good at organizing tasks. And um, the third one, I'd say almost the most important, is how much power that leader granted themselves. And if we look back through history, there are many examples of great leaders who, I mean, the best example I can think would be in like a dictatorship. 
There's been many falls of dictatorships. While even though the dictator was a, may have been a great leader and a powerful, a powerful, you know, human, um, they granted themselves too much power. And I believe too much power can go to your head. I believe to one person having too much power is never good. There should definitely there should be a system of checks and balances in a leader member relationship. But uh, so yes, that's the third, the third um, thing that Dr. Fiedler believed leadership was based on. After, uh, after this comes contextual theory. Uh, contextual theory is still widely studied today, and it uses, uh, the cool thing about contextual theory is it includes multiple facets of other theories, and it takes in, you know, it takes in bits and pieces from, uh, from different ones, and contextual theory really try to focus on, while what you do inside the organization clearly matters, What's going on outside of the organization almost matters just as much. And three things I want to point, three facets I'd like to point out specifically related to contextual theory are gender relations. I know that's a huge topic these days. Um, we're all searching for equality. We want equality in the workplace and equality in the office. Uh, organizational structure is another huge facet of contextual theory. How, how well a leader can organize his company or his group and will have, a, will have a profound effect on the strength of that leader. And the third and final one is current cultural norms. I know, especially in today's society, um, we're experiencing a cultural shock that we haven't uh, seen in a while, and it will definitely affect how leaders behave and how well they are able to lead inside their organization. And that's, con that's contextual theory. It's still widely studied today. As I mentioned, there's many uh, examples, even in 2020, of why contextual theory makes sense. Um, so in about the 1970s, when uh, contextual theory and contingency theory were kind of, they weren't being, you know, they're kind of being phased out, new, new things were starting to be discovered, a group of people started to question whether studying leadership was even worth it. It was it worth the money and the time and the, uh, the resources put in to, you know, to to study it, and uh, this, this is not a skeptical theory. Um, and skeptical theory was, it definitely, I think it has its place, obviously, in the history of leadership. I don't personally believe in it too well. I think that studying leadership is a massive, massive, uh, is a massively incredible thing that we should continue to do, but that's skeptical theory. And uh, after a while, it kind of fizzled out, and they paved the way for new forms of leadership, such as the relational theory, this was the first theory developed after the skeptical theory in the late 1970s. And uh, this theory is very important because it um, originated vertical dyad linkage, which is essentially what we now know as LMX relationship theory. And um, it's still widely used today. Um, we see LMX relationships nearly in every part of our lives. So vertical dyad linkage though, developed by relational theory in the, in the, in the 1970s. Um, moving on to some more modern forms of studying leadership. Uh, we've got new leadership theory. This was developed um, in the mid 1980s and the reason it's called new leadership theory is because it got people back into studying leadership more. It, it, it opened the floodgates and uh, many scientists were interested in the field. Researchers became interested in the field again. Um, this led to the origin of charismatic leadership theory as well as transformational leadership theory which are two very important theories um, of leadership that we still study today. So new leadership theory um, got people back into it, got people excited about leadership study. Um, now the really, the really newer ones, there's two really kind of newer ones that have just been started developing in like the 2000s. And uh, the first one's informational processing theory. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a relatively new school of thought. It's uh, similar in many ways to trait theory, as I mentioned the original theory. But it's uh, it dives much further into like um, psycho the psychology of the leader and how it's it's just a, basically a much more refined and um, accurate version of trait theory. But that's information processing theory. And um, last but not least, one of the more studied schools of thought in 2020 is known as biological and evolutionary theory. Um, this is, a, it's the, as I mentioned, it's the newest theory. It's also somewhat similar to, um, to trait theory in the fact that it focuses on leaders' traits. But what's interesting about biological and evolutionary theory is scientists are looking to genetics and heredity 
as a, uh, as a source of why people act the way they do and why they have these traits. And um, that's obviously possible with the new technology these days. And uh, yes, biological and evolutionary theory. Um, and those are the schools of, uh, schools of thought regarding leadership studies. Um, so thank you very much for bearing with me. Um, I hope this presentation finds you well, and have a good day. Thank you.